So the, um, the first thing I want to say is that, oh my goodness, what has happened to my pinning of everybody, um, is that we are recording this. So if you're uncomfortable being recorded, please stay muted and keep your video off. Otherwise you might show up, um, but it, that's up to you. Uh, also, please just keep yourself muted so that we have a continuity for the presenters to bring us this wonderful program. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat and um, we will get to them when Hazel and Maria can do that. So we are excited to bring you these wonderful people. Hazel Archer Ginsburg is a trans dominational minister, essayist, lecturer, performer, and poet, who many of you know. She writes and curates reverse ritual, understanding anthroposophy through the rhythms of the year and the I Think Speech podcast. Hazel's been the cultural events and festival coordinator for the Rudolf Steiner branch in Chicago for over 10 years. She is a member of the Central Regional Council, the School for Spiritual Science, the Esoteric Youth Circle, and the General Council of the Anthroposophical Society in America. Also with us today is Maria Thoraeka. She is a eurythmist, a eurythmy therapist, actually, with the School of Eurythmy in Spring Valley, New York. Maria still performs regularly at conferences and workshops, and she's taught Rhythmy for over 40 years. I'm so glad to bring both of these people to you tonight. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing some friends out there. Hello, beautiful ones. Wow, I can't believe we have, we have reached this pinnacle, haven't we? It's this Easter tide, it's this amazing threefold festival, right? It's it's pretty pretty amazing. You know, we we it's 40 days after the resurrection. We arrive at this Ascension Thursday. Interesting that it's a Thursday, right? There's something about the planet uh Jupiter that is aligned with Thursday, you know, this expansive planet, right? So that, I think that's that's pretty interesting. And then, of course, 10 days later brings us to, to Whitson or Pentecost, which means White Sunday or 50 days. So, yeah, thank you for being here so we can tune into these, these energies that are available to us now at this, this season of expansion, of, of blossoming and, yeah, and, you know, coming into fullness. We definitely look around and we, we see the plant kingdom stirring upwards in growth and how it's being touched by the, by the warmth and light from above, calling forth color and scent. Our lilac bush in the back had a pretty amazing year this year. It's starting to wane now. But, and the lilies of the valley, oh, those little tiny flowers, so fragrant and, and just heavenly. So we can see that the whole, the whole of nature is, is reaching upwards toward the heights. And yeah, you can feel it, right? There's a longing in the human soul, a striving also upward in unison with nature, seeking the, the touch of world warmth from the sun, from our human encounters. This, this mood of ascension attunes all of life to these cosmic expanses. And through the glory of the seasons, we take part in the, the breathing in and the breathing out of the earth soul, right? So at the time of the ascension, nature celebrates the ascension of the soul of the earth. And it's, it's not by chance that the, the 40 days between Easter and Ascension coincide with this season. And every year, when the earth begins to breathe out in the springtime, the mystery of the Ascension of Christ, who is the spirit of the earth, is renewed. And the constellations are they're shifting and they're coming into their summer places now, the planets, the wandering stars, right? They're, they're treading their ordered measure, that harmony of the spheres, right? 
We're coming into their, their courses around them. So these, these points of light in the heavens point us to the spiritual beings who direct the life of the universe. And from this point of view, ascension can be called the festival of the hierarchies. Now there's a connection here with the holiness. Remember that when the Christ chose to, to come into earthly incarnation as a sacrificial deed that would redeem our fall from paradise, he had to make his way descending down from the Godhead, from the, the Trinity through each of these nine ranks of the hierarchies to come into human form. And that when the cosmic Christ entered the body of Jesus of Nazareth at the baptism, these beings lost his presence. They could only find him by looking into the depths, bearing witness to the God who had entered physical existence. Well, so now at the Ascension, we have this reversal. The Christ force transformed through his human incarnation makes its way back to the Godhead and bringing with him the mystery of death. And we have to remember that those eternal beings who created us, since they're immortal, they, they have no concept or experience of death, as mighty as they are. So Christ's ascension revealed this mystery to them for the first time. The sacrifice Christ initiated on earth was the antidote to the consequence of death brought on by the fall. It's the redemptive deed that turns death into life. We're, we're still learning what that is, aren't we? Right? The, the, it's a seed, right? This, the seed of Christ's deed continues to grow in the earth made ever more fertile through this renewed connection to the stars at Ascension. We know with biodynamics, the earth needs to have that cosmic energy come into the earth to be renewed. And when we have this connection with the stars, when we remember to speak with the stars, we, it, 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 it reminds us as earthly humanity that we have a cosmic citizenship, right? It signals this this return of the lost world of the earth into the company of the stars. That's the way I like to, to think of it. So this reconnection was prefigured in the story of Jacob from the Old Testament. And we see that this prefiguring a lot in mythologies and, and ancient cultures. Right? They give us this little hint, they give us this way of of because our human consciousness changes to prepare for a big change that's gonna, that's gonna occur. So in this great story, we, you know, he's got this dream of the stairway to heaven, right? Jacob gives us the prophecy of the ascension, this, this golden ladder set between heaven and earth on which the hierarchies and our beloved dead released through Christ's harrowing of hell, which happened on Holy Saturday, so that now they can ascend and descend. They're not stuck anymore in our man's realm. And it's the same thing before the call, we were talking about our descendants, right? Those who are wanting to come into uh, incarnation now too. This, this helps that that can occur as well. And so when the risen Christ returned to, quote, sit at the right hand of the Father at the Ascension, he became the bridge between the above and the below. The Christ impulse, yes, it dwells in the earth. And 
extends into the divine presence to fulfill the prophecy of Jacob's ladder. So that through this deed, humankind is, is brought near again to the cosmos. And what's important to recognize is that as the Christ has ascended, so too in the fullness of time will humanity be transfigured. We came from spirit into matter, and from matter, we will once again be Holy Spirit. The, the company of the hierarchies wait for us, their, their younger siblings, to, to ascend. First, we have to first do it in our thinking, don't we? And then we can, we can meet them in fellowship and recognize that they are there working all the while at our sides. So clues, yeah, there are clues everywhere. This ever-present help is, is everywhere. And it's especially present through the festival life. That's, that's what I love about this, you know, looking at the cycle of the, of, the, of the year as a path of initiation. There's this cosmic and earthly flow that we can put ourselves into, and it gives us that the energy and the extra oomph to our will forces to, to bring in these, these clues, to recognize them. So the second Christ revelation, this coming in the clouds, which Rudolf Steiner spoke about as taking hold in 1933, for instance, it's here. The fulfillment of the secret promise of the ascension is the second coming, right? Yeah. It was said to the apostles, he will come again in like manner as you have seen him go up into the clouds of heaven. So this, the ascension is the seed of this second coming. And the second coming is the fulfillment of the ascension. So it's, it's really up to us to, to take that in, to live into that, to, to, to expect it, to look for clues for that. Before we, we came on the call, we were talking about, hey, have you been cloud gazing today? Are you, are you, are you, are you open to receiving this, this inevitable miracle? And yeah, lots of these prefigurings. So, so besides the, the Jacob's Ladder, another prefiguring of this second coming is the transfiguration. This showing of his etheric body, right? This expansion that is completed during the ascension. And of course, it's also shown in, in Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. That's a, that's a famous one. And, and I, I was thinking about this a lot last year, especially, you know, this correspondence to the, the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? That it has that same quality. And so that led me to think about this connection with the second coming of Christ in the etheric and how it, it also has this correspondence with, with what we can see manifesting in the many Marian apparitions. So, yeah, I talked about this a little bit um, with the Guadalupe connecting to the spirit of America, but you can see throughout the ages here in different parts of the world, the, this manifestation in the etheric realm. And Steiner tells us that, that people who can live into the event of the ascension in their soul can have their own their own Damascus experience. That starting in the 20th century, human beings are able for the first time to experience this, this Christ event spiritually as St. Paul did. And before that, it was really only initiates, right? Like Zarathustra, who, who could who could tell that, that, that this was coming. Or 
in the case of the, the Marian ap uh, apparitions, it was the simple peasant folk, right? The shepherds, pure of heart, who were able to have such experiences. A lot to think about there. So I, th I thought maybe I'd just take a breath. I kind of just went right into it. And I just wondered if anybody had any questions, um, anything to add. As Diane said, you could write it in the chat or, um, yeah, we could, we could take a minute here to just check in with each other. And if you, if you uh, if something's not quite clear, or if you have something to add that, that will benefit the whole, please, please let us know. Maybe you could just unmute and, um, and speak. I can't see everybody. Oh, oh, you want to go back to the app? Hazel? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, I couldn't see the bottom ones of the apparitions where they occurred. Oh. It wasn't on my screen. Okay, let's see. Well, we have uh, Fatima, right, was in Portugal, and that was in 1917. Yes. And then in Belgium, 1932, uh, and another one in Belgium in 1933. Thank you. Yeah, it, this is, that whole thing is such a fascinating subject and maybe one day we can do a, a seminar about that, huh? Nicolette, did you, did you wanna speak? Rod has his hand raised. Go ahead, Rod. Yes, hi. Um, a lot for me to um, digest. Um, and I'm glad I have a little bit of familiarity with some of these words. <laughs> they're, they're not words that we toss around in ordinary conversation with our neighbors. <clears throat> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have been reading, uh, uh, I've been uh, devouring uh, a number of Steiner's books that have been published um, lately. And this is a fairly recent thing for me. And, I, and I've been pondering how he fits into this as, a, as an individual, as a human being, as a spirit. Um, it just... Uh, I find it hard to comprehend who can do this. How does he, how did he do this? No one else talks like this. I've, I've heard one man that presumably channeled John the, the Beloved, and I, I've heard this kind of intelligence, but um, Rudolf Steiner is, um, so anyhow, I'm just trying to picture in this process that you've just described of ascension, um, what I'd be curious what your answer is to my query about him. Well, I think, you know, besides the fact that that he was a great initiate, I mean, that, I mean, how, you know, I mean, when you say that, what does that mean, right? It's hard for us striving seekers to really understand what that is. But through many incarnations, he has a, a mission to, to bring this uh, meaning of the earth, which has to do with, with this mystery of Golgotha to human beings. And so there's been a preparation in his life, in his many lives to, to do that work. But, he, but through what he gives us in spiritual science and, and how he actually is able to read this Akashic record, which is uh, there for, for, for those who have re reached that level and can, can do that, He's mm. helping us to interpret what's written there. And also, like I find that when I read his works on the gospels, et cetera, he really helps to explain what it says there as far as you know, what, what these, these gospels, these stories are giving us. So I, I'm gonna have a bunch of these little quotes there from the Bible that I, that I can help. 
and to have a spiritual scientific insight into them really kind of breaks them open. Again, it's these clues, you know, and so we can, we can know that there are those who are a little bit or maybe quite a bit ahead of us, you know, sending the light toward back toward us so that we can start to see these things for ourselves. And for me, you know, I feel like when I read something, I, I, if it rings true for me, then I try to do more investigation. I try to understand it on, on each one of the levels of the physical level, the, 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 the etheric level, you know, how does it work in, in, into my formative forces? How am I, think, you know, how am I thinking about it? Uh, you know, and really apply what he gives us through imaginative thinking and inspiration and, and intuition and to, to do this work of doing the research for myself to make it my own. So, um, you know, I think it's important that we, we take what Steiner gives us and really do our own research into it. And these are mysteries, but, you know, and even the apostles who were there uh, at the time when these things were happening, didn't quite understand exactly what was happening, right? We, we are still being prepared and it's, it's only been a few thousand years. So we're, you know, that seed has to continue to grow in us. And that's why I think we should be talking about this with our neighbors, because to me, that's how, you know, when two or more are gathered, that's how these things can, can grow among us. So that's, that's what I would say for, for now. Yeah. So I wanted to bring this beautiful little poem by Novalis because it really, it really touches on the occult truth of the connection of the ascension with this second coming. In heavy clouds, let him ascend. And so also let him downward tread. In cooling streams, let him be sent. In flames of fire, blaze his descent. In air and essence, sound and dew, to permeate our whole earth through. Sometimes it takes a poet to really bring these, these things through for us. And also I think Eurythmy really helps. So to help us embody this, this powerful vision, I'd like to invite my, my dear friend, Maria, to come and work some Eurythmy around this, this imagination with us. So welcome everyone. In my early 20s, I first heard the name of Rudolf Steiner and, and then heard of Waldorf Education and the third call was Anthroposophy. The fourth call was Eurythmy. And I also embraced um, the Christian Community Church. And there was a book on Ascension that talked about a scientist, Luke Howard, who named the clouds, who studied the clouds. So I wanna speak first about the clouds. Uh, he gave them Latin names, but the cumulus, the ones we love where you can see castles in the sky, those are heaps of clouds. And the stratus are layers. And the cirrus are curls, like curls on your in your hair. So that's, and that's the ice, the icy ones. And we need all four elements to create a cloud. It needs a speck of dust. So when we begin to move, we're going to imagine a bit of earth and then the warmth of the sun and then the water rising through the warmth, gathering around a speck of dust and then rising into the air. So we have all four elements in the clouds. But before we get up, I also was thinking about our feet. And I'm so glad, Hazel, your images are just perfect. Um, 
really beautiful to give us these images. Did you notice the feet as sent, that the Christ ascends into the clouds and the painters that showed the soles of the feet? And in the rhythmic training, we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and had to draw different feet in different um, cultures and, and um, ages. And the one I loved was the soles of, the, of Christ's feet at, at the ascension. And then another image when you see soles of feet is when someone's in prayer on their knees and their feet are behind them. So you can picture that. And, and think, think of the foot, think of a baby's foot, how soft and, and it hasn't been on the ground yet. And compare your hand with your foot. I still have some soft padding here. Yes, but we say the heels are the hard part, the will, the toes are the sensitive part. And then what's beautiful is this arch. You see what's in the space between. There's a legend from Serbia where Michael and the devil, the devil steals the sun and brings him to earth. And Michael has to trick the devil to get the sun back into heaven, but he's wounded. The devil has pulled out a hunk of flesh from his foot just as he steps over the threshold into heaven. And he comes thus wounded to Father God, returning the sun in its rightful place. And the Father God says, this shall help human beings remember that yes, the foot belongs to the earth, but the arch belongs to the heavens, the arch of the heavens, the dome above us, the dome of the heavens. So these, these words are in the poem by Novalis on Ascension. And as Eurythmus, we, of course, the images are very important and the rhythm of the poem. And then we look at the sounds. And I want this to be easy for us, but also an experience of, of these sounds. We have the word him, H-I-M, sorry, him, him, him his descent, hit, hit, let him ascend, let him downward tread, let him be sent, and then blaze his descent. So we have um, the H, a breath sound. We have S, descend, ascend, sent, and we have the M, not so much, but it's important for a reason. And I thought we would just get started now and see how, how far we get. Okay, so I'm gonna stand up. I wish I could do, maybe I can get you all in the, oh, there you all are. Yes, now I see you. So we can do it in our chair if you want, but I'm gonna stand up. You're free to join. So first of all, we find our feet on the ground and ground ourselves. And then rising up into our uprightness, the gestalt, standing upright and free. And then I'm gonna turn on a light. Ooh. So feet on the ground, push against the floor and something in you rises. And there is light in our thinking. Now step apart and your weight shifts down and you're much more grounded now, warmth in our limbs. And now I'm going to give you all a hug and take you into my circle. Joy in our souls. Hey. And I have, that's a pause. Let's do it once more. Eat light in our thinking. Oh, warmth in our limbs. Oh, joy in the soul.
Beautiful. So in, sorry, there I am. In heavy clouds. <sighs> but it's heavy. Heavy. In heavy. You could do it the other way. Uh, um, an incoming H. In heavy. Getting even more dramatic. Heavy clouds reach down to the earth. You just need a speck of dust. Feel the warmth on your back. The sun is pulling you up with the water and the air into the light. Oh. Let's make a little cloud. Oh. And grow your clouds. Hello. Beautiful. One last big hell full of light. Let him. Let him in my heart. Oh, we can send it in and out. Let him. Bit of an M. Let him. Now, how are we going to ascend? We have to take an S. Let's just do one arm. It's easier. Ascend. And now the other arm. Ascend. So we're up in the clouds. You ready to try two arms together? One goes first. The other follows like Jacob's ladder up to the sky. Oh, good. Ascend. And now let's do that again. In heavy clouds. And another L. Let him ascend. So also let him downward tread. Isn't that great? We have this rhythm in heavy clouds, let him ascend, and so also let him downward tread. Do you feel how strong that is? Let's just do this second line. I hope I didn't rush you into it. And so also, let him downward tread. A big O. And so, also, let him downward tread. Now, if we wanted to have something of a form, you notice I'm just going forward and back. In Eurythmy, we call this an E line. Sorry? I can't understand. So I'm sorry, I didn't understand. It's okay. So if you're walking on a straight line, you want to get the quickest distance between two places is a straight there. Straight on a tightrope. And now as you come down, feel that you're rising behind you and you're growing taller as you go back. This is the ego line. Or I am. I am rising up. And of course, you know, in German, <laughs> Do you feel how you grow stronger with that German ich? <laughs> Once more, straight line. Eesh. Eesh. Growing bigger and taller. 
So the two lines again, just on the straight line, heavy clouds begins. And then we're going to rise up for the ascension in heavy clouds. Let him ascend. So also let him downward tread. And moving on in cooling streams, let him be sent. Cooling streams, I really want something to flow here. You feel it can go one side to the other and it doesn't matter which side. <laughs> nice. In cooling streams, let the water flow. Good. In cooling streams. In cooling streams, let him be sent out to each other. And now we have a breath sound with an F. Let it flame up in the flames. Sorry, in flames of fire blazes descent in flames of fire. Blaze has an A and a Z, his descent. Let's do that again. In flames of fire, oh, it would push you up on your toes. In flames of fire, blaze his descent. Let's do those two lines again. I'm giving myself a squeeze. I don't want to lose anybody. You all seem to be with me. In cooling streams, let him be sent. In flames of fire, blaze his descent. In cooling streams, bring in the water element, feel the waves. In cooling streams, let him be sent in flames a fire blaze is descent in air and essence sound and do in air feel it rolling around you the storm is coming in air and essence. Now we have so many essential oils, you almost have a scent, don't you? Essence. And now sound. Oh, how, how should we do the sound? It's an S, but it has this beautiful owl. Which is done like this in your rhythm. Sound. Let's make a rainbow arch. Sound. We're sounding two ways. Sound and do. <laughs> Once again, in air and essence, sound and do it. Just let it waft you any way you want to go. Around you go, feel the air around you, in air, in essence, sound, and do, to, t, 
to permeate, permeate, permeate our whole earth through. We're blessing the earth. Feel the blessing all the way down to the ground. Wonderful. My goodness. Whew, I don't know. Sorry. Um, before we finish, you can do this in your chair. What just came to me, Hazel, is this HMSM that Dr. Steiner gave for, to help us. He's given us so much help um, in the Eurythmy Therapy course. He spoke, how can we overcome, <clears throat> excuse me, the sting of the adversary forces? So right in today's day, we have a lot of anxiety. I, I, I see children with so much anxiety. And that is you can't breathe out. You're just overloaded, senses are overloaded. And this, this is a release. And think of who pulls us up and out when we get full of pride, full of ourselves. What can we do to, to mitigate the sting of Lucifer? And it's, I feel it very strongly over my head, up in the clouds with Lucifer. <laughs> and really feel the sensing fingertips. Mm. This sensing of the M. Now, our other adversarial force, as we like to say, is also part of us when we become too hardened and too much form, too much, we can become sclerotic. It can be, a, um, it's a cold illness as opposed to the, the inflammatory illnesses, right? This, this would have to do with anything that's going to inflame, to mitigate the flame. And then this other pole is the S, like the sting or the magician with his wand controlling things. I am in control. But there's a sting to Armon. S, downward, him. Mitigate the sting of Armon. So just to close, I thought this was appropriate for this poem because of all the H's in him. And Rudolf Steiner says with the verse, the sounds are so important, they're actually healing. So I, I wanted to bring out the H, M, and him, and the S's for ascend, descend, and essence, and so many S's that can be sent. So to finish, and S. And give yourself a squeeze. And thank you all for joining me. I am, um, and thank you, Hazel, for asking me. Perfect. Thank you so much. How enlivening. Yeah, you know, I just, I just really do love these lines from Novala. So thank you for, for bringing them alive for us and then bringing the antidote. It really is about that, isn't it? We have all of these, these um, things that we can put into action in our lives. And, I, and I, what I like about this is because it's not only a, a true insight revealing the occult connection between the ascension and the, the second coming, it also gives us a picture of the interaction of the elemental beings. Do you, do you see that? How it has like all of the elements there? I loved how that, that description that you gave about the cloud, how it really has all of the elements in it. And so we can really see that uh, ascension can also be called the festival of the elements. 
So the, the festival honoring the beings of, this, of the nine hierarchies is also a festival of the elemental beings. So we see this connection of as above, so below, right? And the realm of the clouds, yeah, just like Maria said, it's, it's where, where the elements meet. It really is this, this mix of, of air and water and those, those little particles of earth and this warmth that, that rises into the etheric realm. It's the life body that borders the material world. And entering that realm moves us into the etheric body, the, the aura of Mother Earth. And we, we do, we pass through this sphere before birth and after death. And every time we look up at that be beautiful blue sky, this, this magical realm of the clouds, it's, it's a portal. We can glimpse the miracle of the second coming of Christ. This, this was the promise given to the disciples. They did not know when, and we also live with that expectation. That was part of what Rod's question was, you know, how do we do this? But you know, more and more people we hear stories, right? They have had these experiences of, of seeing someone or feeling a, a touch of a being who, who exudes love and brings comfort in times of grief and distress. And we can, we can see it as a mystery. And we can also ask, are you the one who has come again? Are you the one who, who moves between us like liquid light, wafts between us like, like gossamer, weaving within us, there to, to meet us in our, in our fears and, and in our suffering, in our, our heartaches and in our loneliness? And feeling the, the nearness of a being who maybe just for a moment takes on a human form or, or who with, with our angel or perhaps with one of our beloved dead calls out a word of warning that, that stops us in our tracks and protects us from entering a danger zone. We, that kind of thing happens all the time. Shana gives all these wonderful examples of what would have happened, right? If we would have left the house on time, you know, something holds us back and we wonder why. These, these beings that are there to, to lift us up when we feel cast down. You know, these, these things that sort of appear like a flash of light when we, we feel utterly lost in the dark. So we have to look for these things, they're, they're there. But we have to recognize them and see them and, and how we can help each other and be, be that for each other. Because really all over the world and all at once, this presence, can be felt. We can feel it now in this etheric space that we, we are consecrating by, by what we're talking about right now. This, this is the cosmic dimension of the Christ impulse now. It, it is the true antidote to these world crises that seeks, you know, this is what's trying to touch us right now, but it really is about bringing us together. So will we recognize this, the second coming and turn to this presence, invite it into our life body, the, the etheric dwelling place of our living heart. This is why we're talking about ascension right now. It's not just some thing from the Bible. It's not something that happened 2000 years ago. It's happening right now, right? And we can attune ourselves to the elemental beings on the earth, this earth that we all share. And when we consciously connect to beings such as Raphael, right? Raphael, the archangel of spring, happening right now, we can, right, bringing this caduceus, bringing this healing, we, we can awaken to the way that these these spiritual entities constantly interact with the earth 
through the interweaving of the elements. So we, we got that going for us too, don't we? And for this reason, the fruits and the flowers are in reality not just amazing products of earth. They're also heavenly forms filled with earthly substance, just like us, <laughs> right? So during these 40 days after the resurrection, during this vivid seasonal activity, the disciples received from the risen Christ his esoteric teachings, right? Before that, he was speaking in parables. They didn't really, they weren't quite awake. They didn't really understand what he was saying. During this time now, when he's in this etheric body, he's able to, to, to give a direct teaching. And this is essentially what comes to us through Dr. Steiner from the contents of the fifth gospel. Friends, if you haven't read this fifth gospel, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It, it reads like a novel. It's so important. And he tells us in, in, that, in that book of reading the Akashic records there in this fifth gospel, that then after the 40 days, the disciples witnessed the risen Christ being received into the clouds. This expansion of his presence, like the unfolding of a flower into the universe. And Steiner tells us that at the same time that Christ was ascending, an imagination arose for the disciples. A vivid spiritual reality of what would have happened to earth existence if the mystery of Golgotha had not taken place. So there's this ascension process happening. And at the same time, it's revealed to them that human bodies would have so deteriorated that all of humanity would have perished. So we are meant to realize that on the one hand, the incarnation of Christ on earth rescued the physical human body. And that's a given for everybody, whether we know the Christ or not. But the ascension goes a step further, fortifying our etheric forces as well. So Steiner says that in order for our formative forces to properly take effect, the Christ impulse must be able to penetrate into the human soul during sleep. So that the you know, the ego and the astral body it leaves the body, right? Leaves the etheric and, and, and physical body in the bed. They, these parts of ourselves, this ego, this astral body takes the impulse of the Christ that we've learned on earth into the spiritual world. So we're, we're doing a service to the spiritual world. But, but we can only do that if, if, we, if we've consciously been able to recognize the significance of the mystery of Golgotha when we're awake. Does that make sense? So the spiritual effect of, of what we call the rescuing of our etheric body in sleep, as well as in life and again in death, can only proceed from a true recognition of the deed of Christ. And that's why we're talking about this stuff. We have to, we have to enliven it so that it can work on all these other levels. So living into the essence of the ascension prepares us to fulfill our task as anthroposophers in recognizing that the appearance of the etheric Christ must not pass humanity by, right? We're so distracted, we're so, like missing it. We're not looking up into the sky or into our hearts. We cannot let this opportunity pass us by. 
It cannot go onto the screen and not find the price there. If it were to go unnoticed, without the proper striving toward understanding, humanity would forfeit an important possibility for evolution. The ascension event can bring light to human beings only if we awaken to this new perception of grace, which gives the opportunity for a renewal of our etheric bodies. So I'm wondering if this is making sense to folks. Yeah? Do we need another time for questions or how are we doing? Everybody together? Are we feeling we're in the upper room? We're, we're together, we're feeling this. How important it is to, to take these things into our formative forces and to recognize this as an opportunity. And even if we can't see it, you know, we're not having a, you know, a Damascus event, you know, we can still have an imagination. We can still be open to the inspiration. We can, we can go out in nature and see it in the elemental beings. We can try to feel it within ourselves, right? And we can talk about it and remind each other that, that this is the work we're doing. So I'm gonna go on if there's not anything else. If, how does that feel? Okay, we're good? Maria. Hi, I just wanted to say, and maybe you're gonna say it, but the, why this is sending into the clouds and then the second coming that you spoke about returning in the clouds, it's this picture of this, of the angelic realm. Christ is in the angelic realm in the ether. And I just meant to say that and wanted to add that in, although I'm sure you're going to speak to that as well, Hazel, that we can think of our higher being so that when we go to sleep at night, we review, first we review our day, but we also then meet our higher ego and higher astro body before that's, that's waiting for us after death and is, is, is still there in the spiritual realm. And I think it's, it's, it's part of us, this, this, um, this being that is there for us, these great spiritual beings. So thank you, Hazel. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a beautiful point. Yeah, I try, I tried to stress that a little bit about this idea of the of the Jacob's ladder as well and our the, the descendants, right? And uh, and also that that angel being that our guardian is there for us, right? So 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 that is the thing that we get that little that little notion like, oh, you know, maybe I should turn right here instead of left, or maybe I need to just stop for a minute. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you know, those, those, those intuitions that we get are coming from our angel. And so when I talk about this idea of ascension being a festival of not only the elements, but of the, of the hierarchies, it starts with us because we're, the, we're striving to be the 10th hierarchy. But then we're working with our angel and our angel is working with the, the archangel and the archangels working, you know what I mean? So it goes all the way up. And, and the point of the ascension is now that realm to the highest of the high, the, the, the Trinity itself is open to us. So you're right, by, by working with our angel, trying to be conscious just on that, which is a pretty high level, we can, we can connect all the way up to the father forces. And we're, that's the next thing we're gonna talk about. So thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, it doesn't have to feel so lofty and unattainable. We, we got this. We got this. It is in us. And so, yeah, there's this other mystery where the forces of the Trinity are able to come into Earth existence because this festival of ascension opens us to the powers proceeding from the sphere of the Father. Now, this is something that I just it's been hard for me to think about. I just, I don't know. I don't have a, a mother I get. The father I've, I've had, you know, that's my own personal 
psychology that I'm working with. So to understand you know, this, this knowing of the father ground of the world, Maria mentioned the Christian community. That's, that's, this is spoken of in the act of consecration, the father ground of the world. So again, this as above, so below picture, right? And, and, and so this is something we have to strive to understand. We really, really, for me anyway, it's a, it's a big mystery that can, we can touch on a little bit, even a little bit more through this, this festival of ascension. And Shiner tells us, quote, the forces of the macrocosmic kingdom of the sun come into earth existence opening us to the forces proceeding from the sphere of the Father. So Steiner's explaining that, that as a result of these, these conversations over the 40 days with the risen Christ, the disciples were able to receive, quote, a primal, the primal sources of a new imaginative clairvoyance. So this is another you know, this turning point of time that we're always talking about. This is another sea change in human consciousness, starting with these, these dis disciples who then become the apostles when the Holy Spirit comes in. But this they, they're, it's revealed to them the primal sources of a new imaginative clairvoyance. So again, this before we had the clairvoyance that came to us when we were empty vessels and it was a gift. Now we, we're, we're starting to get the seed for this new imaginative clairvoyance. And it's like a muscle that we have to work. And this new imaginative clairvoyance that we can live into now helps to remove the veil, hiding the true image of death. The true image of death in reality is a facet of the Father God in his aspect of, as creator. What is born must die, right? As above, so below. A creator, then there's a mystery there of death. And of course, because of the deity on Golgotha, through Christ, death becomes life. This threefold festival of Easter is, they, it is, it just inter, intertwines. This, this revelation brings the true content of death with its connection to the highest kingdom of the divine father into perspective. Does that make sense? I mean, this is really interesting, right? We, we were, we're taught, don't get sick, don't, get, don't be afraid of, you know, be, be so afraid of death. No, death is, it's, a, it's, it's part of life. There's a mystery there. And we have overcome that, right? The Gospel of Mark tells us. Then the Lord, after he had spoken to them, he was talking to the dis disciples, right? And this is the ascension now. He's taken up into the heavenly spheres and sat down at the right hand of the Father as the fulfiller of his deeds. So there's this sending that happens, right? This mission is accomplished. And now the fruits of that mission are brought back because not only are we evolving and growing, the spiritual world is growing and receiving new, new impulses as well. And we're part of that. You know, we're part of, we have a responsibility for that. So at the moment of the ascension, the true meaning of death as a birth into the spiritual world was made manifest to the disciples. They beheld it with their own eyes to be a process of union with the world of the divine. What a, what a beautiful thing to see and realize, right? We can know, we can know it too. Shana goes on to tell us that, and this is interesting to contemplate, that one of the first experiences that every human being has after death is a contemplation of Christ's ascension, which can reveal to the person's soul 
the true picture of death and its connection with the highest sphere of the Father. So for the person who on earth worked to understand the mystery of Golgotha, this picture of the ascension after death becomes an, an affirmation. But for the soul that, that has not had an opportunity, has not worked toward a true spiritual knowledge, it is a picture of reproach, which then helps them to seek in freedom to understand this mystery in their next life. So since the mystery of Golgotha, Christ has become the Lord of karma. And I could do a whole thing about that. But why I wanted to bring it in here was because that's part of what that is, is this idea of taking our moon karma upon himself, which then enables our soul to find this right path of the ascension so that we can, you know, our soul can then work up into the world of the fixed stars. And we can really work with these high, high spiritual beings. We don't, we don't get stuck with, you know, just trying to hold on to our baggage. So that's a, a, real, a real gift, a real blessing. And that gives us an opportunity for every, every human soul to reach the sphere of the Father, where Christ derived the forces for his resurrection body. So that's a whole thing to talk about too, his resurrection body. is received through the forces of the Father and that's also where our future stage of spirit man is derived. It might just seem abstract and a lot of, a lot of things I've thrown at you here, but maybe you could take that in, right? You know, it's not just this, okay, now we're having this big party with the Father God, but there's now this like, you know, it's like this unlocking of this, this treasure that where now we have access to the, our highest part of our, our evolution, where we will, be, will become that 10th hierarchy. But first, before that can happen, right? The Holy Spirit, who illuminates the individual ego consciousness, had to appear in earthly evolution at Woodson, flashing in through this, this open gate, right? through that, you know, the ladder is open now to pour into us this truth of the mystery of Golgotha and the ascension in full wisdom. But in order for this to happen, Christ had to ascend. So it's all, it is, it's all connected. Yeah, Steiner tells us, quote, then after 10 days, he sent the Holy Spirit, that divine being of the Trinity that does not overpower, but enhances the individual ego of human beings. Right? We think about how that Christ energy could only stay in a human vessel for three years, right? Because it was just, it's the sun, it's just, it just, it's too much. But the Holy Spirit is the healer, it's the comforter, it's the paraclete, right? It does not overpower, it lets us be our true selves. We can be our, you know, have our own eye forces. And with that comes a big responsibility. So that now the Christ impulse can enter human souls through this, this mediation of the Holy Spirit, which enables us, yeah, we can keep our eye in freedom. So that in time we can achieve our, our spirit self. That's the purification of our astral body. So we could go in through you know, all the different bodies of the human being Right? When, we, when we really redeem our, our uh, etheric body, our life body, right? And then the astral comes in. That's part of what the gift of the Holy Spirit is, is purification of our astral. So there's, there's going to be more that happens <laughs> in the future, folks. But we have to understand this first, don't we? So, yeah, this... Since this, this turning point of time, Easter, Ascension, Whitson have remained inseparable from one another. They, 
they, they do, they form this, the, the only movable feast in the cycle of the year in accordance with this, this cosmic law. Yeah. So I'm bringing that slide back again, <laughs> just to see if there's any more, any more questions. Oh, Deborah, go ahead and speak, darling. You know, I, I maybe have encountered this before, but I'm hearing it for the first time when you say that we encounter or we experience the ascension of Christ. Is it at the time of death or when did you say that it happens? Yeah, he, that's, what, that's what Steiner says, that, that it's, it's an experience that we have, uh, you know, when I, I, it's after Kamaloka, when we're in the moon sphere, you know, making the transition because this idea of him being Lord of Karma is able to, you know, take some of that baggage away from us so that we can ascend and go into the, the higher spheres where we receive renewing forces. So there's this image of this, uh, you know, this deed that occurs that it's like, well, if we were like, oh yeah, right, I get that. Yeah, all right, cool. And it's like, okay, here's your pass and you get to go even further, right? That's the way I picture it. <laughs> I'm sure Simon says it much more, uh, you know, scholarly, but yeah. And, and, and if, 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 if that picture comes and it's like, what, what's that? You know, people don't recognize what that is. It's like, okay, well, guess what, guy? You know, this is, this is something we're going to put on your list that when you come down next time, you, you got to look for this, right? Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any things thing to add? Uh, just a, uh, one more little thing to, to give us before we leave. Oh, Rod God. raised his hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate this. And um, just to add a, a little texture to what, what's been said, um, a man that spent many hundred hours in gliders during the war, the Second World War, became um, aware that clouds had spirits. They were a spirit. He said, if you told me, if I pictured the globe, our, our planet, with a plexiglass globe around it with holes in it, thermals, that's another word for clouds, when they squeeze through these portals, we see them but they are an entity and they, they remain an entity and they're individuals. And uh, so I just, uh, uh, when uh, Maria was speaking about clouds and how they combine all of the elements and um, springtime is a time of clouds for me. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch more there to work with and I'm sure just perhaps adds to what you've been saying. Thank you. Ascend, ascending yeah. through the portals into heaven and coming back down and and moistening our earth. Beautiful. And I think of that song. I've looked at life from both sides now. How does that go? <laughs> right. We don't want to make uh, castles in the sky, but I think there's plenty there to work with. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Yes, Hazel, but yeah. in, in regard to that song, which is a beautiful song, on one level, it shows where so many people are. You know, the clouds got into way. I don't know love at all. I don't know life at all. And that's what we're seeking. Right. What are we looking for? What do we, what, what do we need to pull out of the way so we, we were not distracted? Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I wanted to um, bring in this picture, uh, you know, because if you're going to talk about ascension, you have to talk about the, the, the fairy tale. <laughs> and this, this quote, it's a little 
compact, but I, I thought I'd bring it anyway. It's from, from Goethe's Standard of the Soul. And he says, on the river stands the temple in which the marriage of the young man with the beautiful lily takes place, the marriage with the super sensible. The realization of the free personality is possible in a human soul whose forces have bridged the state of regularity with the divine forces of transformation. So it's just what you were talking about, Richard. You know, we can we can see that you know besides this this prefiguring of, of Jacob's ladder, we we also see an imagination of ascension in Goethe's fairy tale. This this joining together of heaven and earth. You know, we, we are, we're meant to live into this marriage of the above and below. We are the conduit between those, aren't we? We are the bridge. And then, and if we, we really have to, you know, freely sacrifice that doubting Thomas part of ourselves so that we can, we can build consciously the bridge that connects us to divine transformation as we live into this ascension, which is at the center of this movable feast of Easter, isn't it? It's the very center of it. So I'll, I'll end with this quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes from, from Steiner, where he says, anthroposophy itself must become like an inner festival of resurrection for the human soul. It must bring an Easter mood into humanity's world conception. So that's our work, friends, to bring that Easter mood into to our worldview. And yeah, we're not done, you know, <laughs> because after today, you know, we, we have to complete that threefold festival. And so I'm just going to throw this out here to invite you to, we're going to do this an online Whitson Festival with the three regional councils of the Anthroposophical Society in America. And so we took this, this title of the sharing from Steiner's concept of Whitson as the festival of, quote, united soul endeavor and spirit community. So that's the next step, right? To, to join together and, and create this, this conscious community. So we're gonna meet on the 29th. Um, it's a week before Whitson. We're gonna pave the way and uh, we're working with the second lecture of the fifth gospel. I, I had mentioned it before and it's, it really is, you know, it's, it's this glimpse into the Akashic rec record that uh, we, so we can see what happened during the original Pentecost. And it really is like a, it's, it really reads like a novel. It's, it's fascinating. And um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into this idea of how the Whitson Festival really highlights one of the greatest challenges of being human, which is a, about placing our individual gifts, our individual I, in right relationship within the social realm. Right. Once we, once we you know, bring in this idea of, you know, we're all one, we're all expanded into this space together, right? We have to remember that there's this challenge of the consciousness soul age where we want to be separate and we want to, you know, just think about ourselves, you know, and, and so it's a challenge to really come together in our groups to, to strive to know spiritual science. You know, we really have to work together as a community. And you know, that's how we can bring and you know, create this, this type of culture. It, it really is an opportunity for us to meet human to human. There are sacraments possible in, in every encounter, even online. So yeah, our, our, our individual strength comes from our personal development and is enhanced when we weave our gifts together with others. That's why I love working with Maria so much. You know, we have to share our gifts. Right? Then, we, then we're really truly knitting our, our social world into a conscious community. So, yep, I hope to see you there for that. And uh, you know, one more chance for, you know, we still got a few minutes if anybody wants to, to share anything else. Yeah. 
And of course, I want to I want to thank Diane for for uh, bringing me on board here for the the greater Boston area. I'm so glad you could come, Hazel. This has been really fantastic. It's just been great. Thank you so much. See, so I'm looking in the chat here. Okay. Yeah, beautiful. And as you, as you talk about the community we need to weld and how we need to work together, um, a form has just been given, a form drawing form has just been given for, um, for children, to protect the children. So if a, a child protection form. So if anyone is interested in that, please just let me know and I would be happy to forward it to you if you don't get things from Laura Embry. Stein already. Beautiful. Yeah, look at all these, these wonderful gifts we have. Form drawing, Rhythmy, uh, Anthroposophical Medicine, and yeah. um, Biodynamics, right? And when a welder school is doing the right thing, that's, that's what we need. We're very blessed. Yes, and Hazel, just in regard, because I just have a musical brain, in, in, in regard to that song, it says, it's clouds illusions I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. It's love's illusions I recall. I really don't know love at all. It's life's illusions I recall. I really don't know life at all. But our job is to learn these things and the way we can really learn is through community. Sure. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the, that's the thing with, with um, with the human being, we can we can take a vice and make it a virtue. That's what we have to do. We're given plenty of opportunities to see what's wrong with, with, with the world, but that's how we learn and that's how we grow and that's that's our our work. Right. It's like the rock tumbler. <laughs> that you polish stones by putting <laughs> tumbling them against each other, right? The ocean makes sand by tumbling rocks and rocks and rocks. And then we have sand. And how much how much sand do we have? How long has that been going on? As long as human souls have needed it. Yeah, we, we really do need each other. And and this resistance that the earth gives us, you know, in my thinking about the feet, because of this downward tread, this a song came to me. Um, the earth whereon I tread, let's not my feet go through, but strongly does uphold the weight of deeds I do. So we need the earth, and then we also need the clouds, and, and that the Christ is there for us in the angelic realm. All this, we can get so easily distracted, but uh, what we're creating as a community is is this warmth towards each other that can become that we strive for love and um, this moral love will become the fifth ether that's what that's the task of humanity when everything else is gone we've had four ethers the moral moral love will be the fifth ether it, it just gives me hope so Thank you. Beautiful. Maybe we should end on that. That's just such a lovely thought. Right. <laughs> you can't get well, that. It was a, sorry, I should give credit. It's um, a Christian community priest in uh, Stuttgart. Michael Debuse wrote about, about this fifth element. So I, it's been living with me. And also the fifth gospel. It, it's, yes. So maybe we'll see you all at our Whitson celebration yes. yes in a few days that's wonderful thank you all so much for coming it's been a blessing and a treasure peace thanks everybody there is a recording if you haven't already requested it just let me know and i will send it out to you after a few days i can't call it on my computer though so hazy will have it <laughs> yep. very good thank you friends <laughs>